That is illustrated here. This is a female snail. Uh, and here you see the development of the small penis. Unfortunately for the snail, it's an unfunctional penis. So it has lost its female capacity for reproduction. It has uh, uh, a replacement, it got a penis, but it can do nothing. And so if that happens, this results in population collapse very rapidly. And that's also uh, what uh, happened. Now, just uh, to finish, uh, are we in extremely bad conditions? We are basically improving. There are new things being discovered, new uh, compounds, new challenges, for example, related to climate change, because climate change, together with chemical pollution, creates a totally new condition. But just to illustrate you here something from the skeleton, and nearby, uh, we are somewhere here, I think. Uh, that is the salinity gradient and uh, the scale. And every freshwater body in Belgium, and I would say by extension, Europe was in extremely bad here in the 70s, in the 80s. We have been monitoring this for decades already. And I show you some of the results. I want to show you the result of oxygen, which is very important because we all need oxygen. And aquatic species, of course, also. So this is here 1996. It's not so long ago, 1996. And this is 2022, and the last series of data that we have. Uh, this is the distance from uh, the mouth of the skeleton. Uh, so here we are closest to the mouth of the skeleton. This actually is the Dutch Netherlands, uh, the Netherlands uh, Belgium uh, border, uh, 60 kilometers away uh, from. Mouth of the scalp, uh, and uh, this is the oxygen level. Uh, you see this very thin line that I've drawn here is at six milligrams per liter. That's what we need to have at least, at least, better eight, nine, ten, but at least six. And you see, this is the situation red, this is somewhere between zero and three. Huh? So, 1996, all over the place, complete without oxygen. And hypoxic or even anoxic condition. And then it improved. But it's only, let's say, not much more than, than, than 12, 13 years ago that we get into a reasonably acceptable condition. So that's not much more than 10 years ago. Right? So that's where we were. And if you, if you go the next part, uh, towards the 80s, you can imagine what it was. And that was all over the place. Uh, but you see, it has much improved, so there is also some good news. Right? Uh, and this is because uh, it has been understood that certain things uh, have uh, to happen and uh, uh, that things have to uh, improve. My final slide uh, is something uh, uh, that uh, actually is also present in this room, there at the back, uh, and that's uh, the project of uh, here, Miriam Bush. Uh, and I was invited uh, uh, during this uh, part of the Hydromedia uh, project uh, by Inge and Inge Henneman, also from uh, Kaskia, to uh, uh, present a talk on, uh, to this part, uh, artist in residence, uh, on uh, uh, water and water-related problems. Because Hydromedia, as it suggests, it also relates to water. Hmm? Uh, so to, to give them some, let's say, scientific environmental context uh, to, to then also uh, develop uh, their work within that uh, framework. And uh, I uh, had very nice interactions uh, with all of uh, with our uh, artists, the residents, and especially with Lydia. Uh, because uh, from that, uh, what she's actually doing, and I think if you have the time, just have a look at the exhibition uh, at the end of this uh, room. Um, she's uh, making photographs of uh, puddles. She calls the project Puddle Watching. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, she creates images of the environment, uh, the urban environment, by uh, uh, imaging uh, the puddles uh, that are present uh, in this environment. And they have a certain level because so suddenly they are generated and they disappear again, and so on. She also takes water samples uh, for here in these bottles. There are bottles, there are also some bottles over there. And uh, we have now extended this project uh, in terms of now trying to physically and chemically characterize these waters, what is in these bottles, and to what extent 
can this, let's say, scientific analytical approach tell us something about the environment in which these pearls are generated? Uh, we've also presented this as a thesis certainly for a master's student, and that student will start working on that project next week. So we are looking forward to see uh, what uh, is happening uh, with that, because basically these are books that there's a lot of interesting information in this book, because they reflect to a certain extent the nature uh, and the anthropogenic impact uh, of uh, the local environment captured by the water of the planet. And that's the next step. Yeah? We will see what we get out uh, of that. Uh, okay, that's basically what I want to do. Uh, basically. Hi, um, nice um, what I will do is I will introduce two different projects that relate. The first one will relate to uh, the topic of water, and also the pollution of water and, and the human influences on water. And another project will relate to the energy, uh, the energy transition and digital technologies, which are also both of the topics that we're addressing here tonight in this later talk. Um, as an artist, I, as already introduced, I uh, have an individual project. I also collaborate a lot with sometimes other artists or some of the uh, technicians, artisans, artists, a lot of different types of uh, individuals. I'm also the co founder of an open space, and one of the projects I will present will also show some work that I have in the context of the project of an open space. Um, the open space is also funded to work together with artists on long-term research projects. So for me it's always really interesting to work around the topic for multiple years and also approach it uh, from different perspectives with different artists but also as an artist with different mediums. So I also try to get a bit of insight into this project. The first project that I would like to say uh, to show is um, uh, a project that I did together with artists to learn from Amazon and Nathan Artists to the Moon Museum. Um, and we were invited to respond to uh, the fact that the Moon Museum was going to move to the Oslo Church in the city, so they were moving. Uh, in the back, you see it was still on construction, but at the moment it's already open. And we were invited to respond to this in the context and to make the work uh, in an urban space or to be a sculptural work, or it was pretty open in the location. And we decided to work with the, the new neighborhood of this uh, museum, so it's really moving to the water side and uh, to a place where there was a river running down the mountains into the port. So it was uh, the brackish waters so and also yeah, the water from the river was running in front of the museum. So we worked um, with the microorganisms in this particular site, um, the ecosystem of, uh, of this place, but also in the river and also in the floods. So we worked with the uh, microbiology department of the University of Oslo. And then um, we can take samples, uh, either by boat or by just by hand. And um, we made a film that was presented for multiple months outdoors. So here you see the projection on the right uh, above the water. We literally show all the stand processes and light inside the water on the place where we also took the samples. Um, as part of the film, um, yeah, we, we, so we worked in the, in the laboratory we used a microscope as a camera, which was a real challenge because every movement was extremely fast, but we managed to, to turn it really into a cinematic tool. And um, the microscope itself, the architecture of the microscope, also became part of the, the, the setting of the film. So the, uh, all these different settings, but also the and uh, all kinds of different elements, part of the microscope, uh, yeah, all, all features that were also implemented uh, as we did in the film, but were also explored as, a, as a, an agent that we as part of the film. So here you see the existing fountain grid with microorganisms, uh, which is also a form of architecture by itself. Um, the film is, is really fictional in the sense that we have 
of scenes, and so we, we refer to all these kind of scientific animals and we get from the kinds of things the, the focus changes in the seconds of this microscope. But we do some dramatic things. So. Here, for instance, uh, you see a shot, which are the skills uh, of microbeads and it's used to isolate one organism, for example. Uh, but in our film, it's also a kind of dramatic gesture, because when you do this, you isolate one specimen, and then often uh, it's used to focus by the monoculture, which is quite a dramatic uh, action to take. Uh, also, something that people will be touched by is the fact that the closer you want to get to the more these organisms, with using a microscope, the more risky is it that they will actually die. And so, with the light microscope, if you want to do something with the glass like this, uh, it's very likely that this will die or that the organisms will die. And if you use a lateral propeller microscope or a propeller microscope, it might cause to be the only way that this person will be dead already. So it's a quite cool, it's also a coolness about this. On, on the one hand, you have curiosity on this life, but on the other hand, it's also quite curiosity. Um, and I will show a small um, fragment, so I need some sound. Um, Uh, all the specimens are mentioned as the catches at the end. Um, and there is a look at the huge microorganisms that are the most. Um, so this is the last one. So, 
lots of samples also including microplastics and uh, samples uh, that were also in the world so we were talking in the research field so there are also a lot of these kind of predicting elements part of the film that we normally don't even see in the microscopic scale um, but they are also of course a bit in that kind of scale um, and the uh, music was made by Henry Vega and also we use the cello as a common element of the computer as the computer generated sounds on the other hand to emphasize the life of the microorganisms in the cello to emphasize the inputs and the architecture of the microscope to both invented in the same period of time so to kind of present the period of development of the computer industry. And we also have Um, as part of the commission, we also made uh, an installation where in the daytime uh, and also later in a large installation setting, and we could also uh, engage with this uh, light on a smaller scale uh, with glass spheres, where uh, here you can see the large installation, uh, where we made the glass spheres with the glass blow and taking extra into the glass to create the lenses. So you see this. On the lens is only glass screen, so you can see the light is uh, large. Um, you can see it's a large installation of the lenses, and we built different constellations in the space, and it's a little bit of a local sample. Um, then I would like to uh, show um, uh, another topic. Um, in, in context of the open space. So it's a uh, work I made uh, as part of the project on trade-off, which was funded uh, by the open space collaboration with Peter and the National Forum. And it looks at um, the future developments of uh, lithium mining in the north of Tatanga, which will be exploited in the future by the Chinese Australian company. And together with a whole group of artists who follow on this to South Africa, Developments uh, around this future mine. And um, I, as an artist, have uh, been looking to everybody's looking at different elements in relation to the situation and how we look at ourselves at um, electricity as a phenomenon uh, and an agent uh, within this whole process. Uh, and also thinking about electricity being something that is quite uh, invisible for us today. So it's, 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 we take it for granted that it's going to Sockets everywhere, but we don't really see it anymore. We don't feel it as a natural kind of agent. Um, here's an image of this uh, mining situation that's it's, it's under construction at the moment. Um, the, the lithium that they are going to exploit uh, is uh, in a uh, rock form, so in a uh, name, and um, yes, what they found that the, the company was going to exploit is that it's. Uh, Largest lithium mines in the world, uh, so it will have uh, quite big consequences for everybody living in this environment. Um, what I um, would like to show, because it's a really big project with a lot of different elements to go into, but if you're interested in to see more of all the other arts that we're producing, you can see our website, which I have in the future place. Um, I'm just going to show a few works that I did last week in this project. I was also inspired, often in my work, I go back to historical moments uh, in science or in society and politics to see how things have uh, developed. Uh, and often in my work, I also end up in the period of the Enlightenment uh, to see that a lot of the science, the science, the science there is a lot of foundation for science that the historians have been in the of time. When you think about electricity and energy, um, in these days, in the 18th century, uh, electricity came up uh, as, a, as a science that was also shared publicly, which is really symbolic in the time of enlightenment, as a kind of conquering of, uh, of nature, of uh, the ultimate. When they discovered the lightning rod, for instance, it was really seen as an ultimate symbol of the form of conquering the biggest force of nature. 
and, uh, and it was often presented in this kind of public presentation so people could feel and touch and see the electricity and a lot of uh, women were also part of these public demonstrations and children um, and a lot of subjects were part of these demonstrations and I wanted in my work to go uh, back to this moment where you could yeah, feel, see, touch uh, electricity as a physical uh, agent so um, it has been developed in a lot of different books. This is a, a collaborative book on the uh, communist artist in Congo, the Rubashi Bayano, where uh, Jean Paul Basson, who is a Dutch guy, who built a model of the Tesla, comes along from the local library, and uh, I've brought several suitcases of Tesla oil, and this one, Tesla Fresh, Nikola Fresh, as the ultimate utopian uh, inventor. Tesla as a symbol of real capitalism. Um, then I developed um, a new technique of, of uh, electrophotography where I used the top, transparent top layer of uh, screen, uh, touch screen technology, like with the touch screen and the phone, for instance, or on monitors to uh, conduct electricity and to capture uh, electricity. Uh, of the room of the photo. So here you see this uh, experimental setup. So I worked together with an electric technician to develop this. Um, it was really a uh, lot of experimentation. After a long time, I managed to, to capture it um, uh, in, in film uh, and, and photo. Here you see uh, two photos of small pieces of mineral from one of it. And one of the artists brought to me, so just little pieces of rock. And inside the rock, there is a lithium, a bit sodium, and it's very conductive. So under this, in this kind of setup that I built, I put, uh, uh, I put the uh, sparks of it so from under this rock to capture them. Here also you see a uh, large wall installation uh, with all the different elements relating to the um, to coal and lithium and e waste and to the district boundary and closer. So, all the light that you see is electricity. It's not electricity. There's no other light sources in this room that is electricity. And I've also made a film um, using this technology um, where I um, Looked at the units of electricity and on the response of all the units that we use to describe uh, the, 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 the yeah, units of electricity. Um, but this a system that is also developed in the 18th century, and all these units are named after the inventors of that period of time. Um, and it's a system that is really um, yeah, everywhere around the world, all the electric technicians will use this uh, language, and also all the there's a lot of symbols relating to this, and it's all standardized, it's all kind of universal language. I, I use these um, nine units as chapters for the film. Here you see, this is also by the symbols. And uh, I'll show just a small teaser showing a lot of different fragments from the film, but the film is 25 minutes, so it's just a little bit more. What kind of materials in there? Because of the sun. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, that sound was very, very soft, but uh, 
All the sound uh, was created by a composer, Pum Bouvier, who uh, recorded uh, me while experimenting in my studio. So it's all electric frequencies that uh, are, yeah, are made to use the composition. Um, then I've also made a series of sculptural works with electricity as, a, as an agent to really create uh, the work. Um, inspired by fulgurites that uh, were, are created when lightning hits, for instance, the a beach. Uh, when you have very fine sand with salt, uh, it can melt. Yeah, there's such an amount of energy uh, coming into the sand that it can melt and create uh, fulgurites into the sand. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but they're kind of shaped like a, like a root. Uh, like a, like lightning, and I was inspired by this to also create a series of sculptures with earth from um, a mine in uh, Belgium here in Genk, um, coal mine, a sand of a coal mine, and some sand from Anono, and sand from Lommel that is used for glass making here in Belgium. It's really fine sand, and again with the electric te technician, I developed a technique um, to uh, replicate this kind of process. Um, to create um, uh, artificial fulgurites, let's say. So here you can see this in process. So it's creating it's, uh, a lot of energy into the sand, literally melting it into the shape, growing into the sand, and resulting into an installation with all these different kind of naturally shaped or artificially shaped <laughs> um, forms. Of, um, of sand. And as you can see here, they they really look, um, yeah, look like naturally created uh, in a sense, like I'm not, I'm not controlled, right? So I couldn't control this process. It's really sculpting with uh, electricity. And I also added sometimes a bit of copper or uh, there were like pieces of coal in the sand that you can still see. It became black or you see little pieces of coal as part of these sculptures. And here is uh, another installation of, of this piece uh, as part of uh, an exhibition with Ontretov we had this year in, uh, in Amsterdam. And then the last work I will share that is actually in development at the moment is um, a live performance uh, as part of this research project uh, where I, together with the composer, uh, Paul Bouvier, and uh, Jean Cattenbaai, who's also part of the project on trade-off, uh, are developing a performance consisting of live experiments uh, in turned into sound composition, a projection with uh, images that... Uh, resemble also uh, part of, that were part of my film, and uh, a text that is also written uh, to rethink all these nine different units of electricity that Jean has written. Um, and yeah, we're currently still developing this, but I will show uh, just a, a small clip uh, of a first experiment we did this year in Frame and Frame. La charge n'a pas de sensibilité morale. Basic foundation of the research, and if they don't touch the objective cover uh, at the center of our work, there are basically three things. One is, is, is um, the uh, um, uh, social media, 
a sociologist cannot study any more society without thinking of social media. There is uh, also, of course, the Anthropocene, so that humans and nature, you cannot divide them either. And then there's finally this also this uh, this transhumanism, this new converging technologies, and this, and the idea that that uh, uh, humanity itself or humans become the center of uh, scientific research, and to check and how to change it to improve on it. And uh, so I made uh, uh, three parts. One part is like how are what are now actually these different uh, technologies, and uh, how did the people provide it? So I have done it from all these different. Uh, technologies and uh, the uh, main researchers and, uh, and their fantasies about it. But uh, I divided the documentary in three series, a little bit Aristotelian, because I thought I cannot mix them, but still, so I want to mix them. But, but um, it's very hard on one hand, but what is the science is the second part, is more the ethical part, the pros and cons, and the third part is the metaphysics, the metaphysics part. So I call this transhumanism part. Um, and for me, it was also funny because of the, all their fantasies, um, how we can uh, kind of mix, mix a different species uh, among each other. And so, on. so for me, it was really funny to illustrate this, this natural science in their fantasies because I got so much to come across. It was hard, hard to all the metaphysics about the science. And uh, so the second so part, part where, 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 where I contrast uh, uh, these discussions goes and goes, but you have to say we have to get as fast as possible, also, but the public debate doesn't, doesn't uh, catch, up, catch up with what's happening. What's happening. So, so otherwise, they might say this. Uh, so I want I want them to be more immortal. And, uh, and uh, other people say we have to be this. So, so I brought this. this, this Thing together, then yeah, this new business because, because all these people they have some kind of time to come up with a few. That's why it's why I thought it's not going to come because it is um, um, the really small so as or or final revelation of eternal life uh, or or the downfall of the world. Um, um, and then I, 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 I introduced the groups from all and all the other religions. I can say, can say for like the Dalai Lama, Lama. It took me two years to get to that time. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, he, 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 said he said to me, I, I only had, I only had to, I could come in for one, one question. And, uh, and said exactly, exactly what, what I wanted, what I wanted to say. So, so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I made with humans, humans and machines, machines robots, robots. Um, um, uh, maybe, maybe uh, next next generation, the Dalai Lama would be one of like that. But that's so that's so many ways to understand. So, so I had I had a, a lot of a lot of top science science and really really had this kind of strange strange physical ways of thinking. How how we are we are in the ninth realm of God? How they decide to go to the was it was the computer power? It was the computer power power. When when we will be able able to send send rocket rockets to the moon for ninety nine years and and that's that cosmic cosmic network. What will be by that by that time? What will be the capacity? And will they will they meet in the like will they bring us bring us to the moon at the end of time? By by bring us in a space to run the program. Um, but this, um, this, 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 for example, is the theory of Frank Hitler, as a station station in the Ventura Ranch Ranch theory. So, uh, so, so all this, all this science, science is that we were surprised, surprised uh, in the in artificial uh, uh, intelligence, but uh, the but the speed is people have a Jewish background, and uh, um, they, they, they say they say that in their paradigm, um, um, basically all the old the old from the same we will uh, 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 revive the whole that was that was what what was was said that the environment are mixed. We see we see that every different different religion are very very strange ideas about knowledge knowledge that not Cannot uh, uh, more and more as a as a, as a, as a basic, basically rational rational debate. Uh, so that, that was that was uh, uh, about so about so. Um, so um, uh, this is just this is just an isolation that I learned about the two digitized scopes on the internet. But finally, I brought the technology because there were slides slices like this, and then the computer would make it the slides slices like this, and this and that, and made them donkey donkeys. They were slides slices like this, and this and that, and made them donkey donkeys. 
Ik heb een nieuwe nacht, 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 They can feel it through my house, and I can look from their house. So, so I, I went over there, and, and I got someone that I need to know in the roof. So we drove around, and I was filming. And, 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 and every, every business, they stopped me. And I said, there's no problem. I will blow all the faces. And, 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 and so, so yeah. it was a funny thing to do. Um, um, this is, this is, I, I, was, I was working on, on another project which I will show later, but, uh, but um, which, is, which is a complete simulation of what, what will happen in the next hundred, hundred years or in this century with climate, climate change. And I, was, and I was in contact with, uh, with um, several scientists about it. And uh, I get so much all this of the I once in the in the person where the money that was out in Brussels. Um I invited uh scientists who were working on this on this um uh uh the I C C the International Climate Change. Um like like After Technopolitics, I wanted to also research uh, uh, several um, laboratories, and I wanted to research where, where they have a, a, a programmatic uh, research done. And uh, I've done a few with an, um, where I also invited, uh, or where I could sit, where a, a social scientist was following them. So to have that confrontation on, uh, 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 on the scene of the research itself. But here, this, this was for me an interesting thing where, where um, they try to, I call it Mil Milgram revoking. Maybe you know the, the, the Milgram test of uh, where someone gets uh, electroshocks. And I agree with the same thing, so, but, uh, but it's a little bit different. So, so two people, uh, uh, they have to vote there, they have their cards. Um, uh, so one takes the cards, you get the electroshocks, and the other one uh, will get into the fMRI scanner. And so it's to see what will happen when you see the other one in pain. When she did, did uh, so they do a little quiz. When she got wrong, when he got wrong, when they both got wrong, or when they both are right. It's only when they both are right that, that she, uh, in this case, it was she. And it's always she, because she is, in fact, the researcher. Um, so she doesn't get the shocks. Well, actually, she filmed herself with the shocks because she, uh, for her, I need to have the real expression for the shock, but I need to have the same expression for all, uh, all the people. So, um, uh, so it was always a video that they showed uh, to them. There were some, some interesting cases. So finally, for me, it becomes a forensic research because um, she did her research wrong. At first, she, um, well, she discovered that, in fact, Asian people are much more, much more empathy than, uh, than uh, Caucasian people. But it's only with the discussion that she realized, oh no, they were all looking at an Asian person. So it's only afterwards that she said, okay, 
and that that you see at the end of the film, you see uh, her uh, colleagues, her Caucasian, getting the electroshock for uh, continuing the test. Um, she did some other mistakes also. So, um, and uh, but it's very interesting when you see how they they then change uh, all the data, the data, uh, and um, so to reinterpret to to uh, um, make the sum uh, or 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 you say that I update them. Uh, and, 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 well, all kind of calculations so that you, you can uh, uh, actually come out with the result or so. Uh, so that's what the thing is about. Uh, then I did a series uh, called Lab Life, where I did the same. I followed the, the, the research team, but uh, each time with an, um, with a, a social uh, scientists. They call themselves embedded humanists. Um, and it's something quite unique. I, the name lab life, maybe, well, it refers to uh, Bruno Latour, his laboratory life, his first book, where he himself was a fly on the wall in the research team. But the difference is, Bruno Latour was an observer. So he just noted down what they did. There is now an, a movement with, within the social sciences of people who um, want to do midstream modi modulation, they call it. So normally the research is at the beginning, and there are some ethicists also, also to, who, who check if uh, everything is okay, and then it's a, it's a go. But then it can take 10 years, maybe or longer, and then the army gets involved, and something an implant for uh, uh, um, I don't know for for the memory loss also becomes something to control soldiers. This is not a joke. This is uh, one of the cases in technocalypse that I show, um, and. Um, so they want, uh, uh, normally it is at the end, again, when it has to come on, out of the market, that uh, ethicists are going to show again, uh, uh, are going to look again, like, um, um, is this okay or not? And when they say no, then you have 10 years of research that was, that was done for nothing. And so I had, um, uh, uh, it, was, it took me two years to find a laboratory that would allow a social scientist from, from outside to look in all the drawers and, uh, and uh, uh, talk to them with a, with a little finger. And on top had a cameraman uh, um, uh, following uh, uh, that whole discussion. And finally, I found uh, three interesting uh, um, uh, projects, one in, in, uh, in uh, biogenetics, one in brain implants, and one in nanotechnology. Uh, and with the three of them, it was very problematic uh, by the end. In fact, the confrontation of them. Um, this was just a team of, of students uh, with biogenetics who, um, there's an international contest every year. They call it IGEM, um, International Genetic Engineering Machines. They call it machines, but in fact it's organisms. It's, uh, it's viruses, yeast cells or bacteria, where they put um, a, 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 a small piece of, of, um, uh, uh, of genes in it, uh, and it's really digital at, at one moment so so what they did is uh, to have a yeast cell and the, and the, the whole reproduction system of the yeast cell um, they used to instead of smelling the pheromones of the other uh, sex to smell uh, tuberculosis and then to have the whole process that instead of that they are, are ready for getting sex uh, um, they get green fluorescent and um, this, these things they cannot go, get on the market, um, but uh, and therefore they use it for contests of students. So it, it's it's a whole system where they do these kind of things because it's synthetic uh, biology. Finally, they took uh, something of our genes from from a smell sensor of tuberculosis. It's, it's a tar smell specific uh, um, a molecule, and. Um, then with some uh, prefixes and suffixes uh, on, on the whole thing to fix it in, uh, um, in the chromosome. Um, it's in fact a, a, a pay, one page of, uh, in Word of CCTTGGAAG and that they send over the internet to a German company and then DHL delivers a little white powder 
to bring it and then they can uh, then they have it and they can uh, uh, implement it in organisms that's how it works um, so I followed them and we also followed there was also then the social scientists and so what they wanted to do with it is of course so you have a little package of this yeast and somebody pukes in it and then when it becomes a green fluorescent you know that this person has a, a, a uh, tuberculosis and it's very interesting today they they, they use uh, rats big rats that can smell it or so this would be much more easy but one of the first questions of my social scientist was and uh, these yeast cells uh, uh, what temperature do they survive well yeah they shouldn't go higher than 35 uh, degrees celsius and then so yeah but when you want to use it in africa and so how long will it will it last and so ah yeah ah yeah so in fact that's a very nice example for this midstream re, uh, modulation like um in fact the whole research was for nothing uh, um even you cannot bring it on the market anyway but normally if you would have thought to do it then it, it uh, would have made no sense because it wouldn't be useful the second one is that uh, um, uh, uh, this is now the, the Amsterdam Medical Center, um, where they are uh, the, the psychiatric uh, department. They are world leader in implants for psychiatric uh, patients, and um, which is is very unique. Is that the next building is in Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, and uh, where they do research on mice and rats and even apes. Uh, the apes I couldn't film, um, but um, this department of the uh, of psychiatry, so they do implants for uh, for depression and and uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and um, uh, they don't know how it works. It works, but they don't know how. So they train. Um, or, or, or they try to produce rats and mice that are depressive or have obsessive compulsive disorder, and then to try the, the implant on them to see, like, in fact, why does it work with, with the humans? So it's the other way around, and we normally think that research is done. Um, and so I followed them, and then also with the social scientist, but finally the social scientist was discovered by the guy who takes care of the animals, and she is a, a bioethicist from the University of Leiden, but he recognized her, and uh, she's an activist, she's an activist. She's somebody who's very moderate in her opinions about it, and so uh, um, she, she thinks you, you can use um, uh, mice for certain reasons if, if, if you really if it's defendable for, for such and such uh, reasons and so Immedi immediately she was person on grata on the on the whole thing so so she couldn't come in the building anymore finally i organized um, that's another project actually i, I did a whole month programming uh, on it's called the brain sessions i did uh, um, where i invited this team and also the the next team at first, we'll talk about that. That's uh, a group of Indian uh, researchers in Japan. And um, their work is fascinating. Uh, uh, also, um, what's his name? Uh, no, I forgot his name. The, uh, the big quantum physics physic, uh, guy from, uh, from Oxford. What? what? Sorry? No, no, he's dead. The other one, the, the, um, um, <laughs> but this guy came over. Um, uh, Roger Penrose, Roger Penrose, uh, um, because he's so fascinated in the in the research of these people, and so he came over to to, to Amsterdam, and I invited him also in the in the discussion, and so that we had. But these guys are crazy, um, and it's so fascinating research. And the problem is that um, so they work in in Japan in the three top uh, research institutions in the world on nanotechnology this guy has huge machines that is the only one to be able to scan on the atomic scale organic material um, but you don't believe what these guys are doing so uh, they created the first molecule and and he says that that molecule resonates in a way that it can kill cancer cells and they're doing research in india um, uh, nobody knows, but uh, so other people are doing research with that with that uh, molecule on the uh, on cancer treatment. But some of these people they discovered that in a, in in a, in a, after a while um, they form in a solution they form wires, 
these molecules. And then they started to think like, hey, but um, uh, maybe if that's the case, so they discovered this because of electrical uh, uh, um, fields. If we can have electrical pulses, then maybe we can create an artificial intelligence in an or organic way or semi-organic semi way. And then they started to research um, uh, the brain, the human brain. But what is funny in this team, because they are nanotechnologists, they always make models. So he goes to a $1 store where he uh, uh, buys styrofoam, uh, um, uh, iron wires, and uh, all kinds of crap, uh, like you see there on the second. So that's his representation of the human brain. Because he says, I always want to see it three-dimensional. But it's absurd. You don't believe what he bought in the $1 uh, store. <laughs> all kind of toilet <laughs> equipment. And so and then, uh, so he may, that's where the proof that he shows me where he makes this thing where you really start to see all these connections and so on. But finally, he researches the human brain and then he thinks like, but how does the connection between, uh, between two uh, uh, neurons work? Is the only one who could, who, so he takes the, the connection wire, the standard, uh, the standard uh, uh, um, model of our brain is, so a, a human neuron receives uh, information, and at a certain moment, it fires uh, uh, um, uh, after so many, uh, there are several constructions. Why at a certain moment it fires? And it fires to its own connections, which are 10, 20,000. And in the standard model, it is that they are all the same signal. But in fact, it's not. Uh, so on the road, the, it, it changes and nobody knows how. And so he has a theory because he could, um, with this machine, um, uh, check inside the, uh, the, the microtubules, which are like, every wire is like an electrical wire. So you have this, uh, all these copper wires inside with plastic around. It's the same. So there, are, there is some layer of fat around. And in, in between, you have these microtubules, uh, uh, 100, 200, uh, like that. And, uh, and he connected that, in fact, they vibrate. Uh, um, it's a, it's a ultrasonic, but um, so and then the whole uh, um, um, new age uh, movement jumped on it. You see that it's possible to be on the same frequency. Um, he doesn't believe it, but he also doesn't care. So we have a social scientist following this. He was an American. He said, "Don't don't go into that. Don't." Go. And but he doesn't care even more because then finally in um, in the back of home, so I invited them. And with all this crap that they, that he made, and I let them in, explain, but they did also live their 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 researches on on the neuron and so, um, and uh, uh, no no I lost what I wanted to say. Um, yeah, well, so, and also Penrose and other people, they, they discussed, and we had a debate because I also wanted to know. So the whole field of this research, all these people came, came from everywhere in the world, and I invited them for a first day to have the debate, and I hoped that during the debate I would know like how these people think of, of this work because it's so fantastic, but uh, nobody can prove what, what he, he says is, is right or wrong. And in fact, nobody knows afterwards. So he just continues his work and he, he publishes or so, but nobody can tell if what he does makes sense or not. So um, this is an, another work um, that I made a uh, um, year or two years ago. Um, actually, it's because another work I couldn't do anymore because of COVID. There was a lockdown. I, I was doing uh, uh, also a documentary series on the, on the commons. I wanted to have uh, follow several uh, commons uh, uh, communities, and then the lockdown came. If there is one thing you cannot film anymore at that moment, it's a it's a commons uh, 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 movement. Um, and so finally, I had my I had the the film fund that that gave me funds for that project. And I had some some uh, uh, private or other institutions that that gave me some funding. The film fund said it's it's fine to put it in the freezer. The others they said no, it has to be made within this year, or you lose the money. You have to give it back. And so I was there like shit. What can I do? Um, so I started to film already, and uh, but then I proposed to them another work that I could do at home. Um, that I started to do with an American uh, game uh, company. 
So it's this um, uh, computer simulation uh, um, where we have, so we integrated uh, all, we had all the data of the last report of the IPCC. They gave it to us um, before it was published, um, but we could integrate it. And it's the first time that I made an, um, a, a work of art uh, just by working in Excel. Um, because um, in fact, we, we had all the, the data and these people, they made a program, and actually, so these are, so it's, it's uh, three screens on the table, um, uh, three times 4K, but you can zoom in twice. So it's in fact, finally, it's, you can see it's the resolution of 48 HD uh, screens. And that is live rendered by the computer. The computer is inside the table. Um, it looks a little bit like a snooker thing because that's how it turned out with my sound boxes and then I thought, yeah, well, then it is a snooker table. Um, and so you can zoom in and you see um, uh, um, all things that happen and it's all on this data. Uh, so we made world maps. Uh, they have different scenarios. Um, um, and uh, how is it called now? RP or uh, um, RCP. RCP. Uh, so, so uh, it's a long time ago already, two years ago. There's, a, there's a four. There's a eight point five, and there's a two point, a two point eight. That's, a, that's a, a, the most optimistic scenario. Uh, these are different scenarios with all things of, of so much rainfall, so much, much uh, a chance for wildfire, and all these things are, are on the world map. So we had all these world maps, and we made a, a small system so that we could make the, the 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 changes and see it on the on the map. And in fact, that's the way that our program works. works. So where, for example, population um, uh, gets higher, you get more buildings at that at, at that spot, and so it grows automatically, uh, um, or it disappears, and so uh, or wildfires. It's at random at these places. But I wanted to add other things, like how do you see that that there is um, a, a one place, one location, one city uh, uh, that where the population leaves. So, of course, we have then the, the traffic roads of, of migration, but also I wanted container ships. And so I made a, a total, uh, uh, I had all the lists of every year, and the amount of containers of every harbor or, or the, the, the 300 biggest. And then uh, I did an estimation based on the population uh, uh, for their estimations of, uh, of the container ships further in this Excel file until finally the computer couldn't handle that. So we had to skip the container ships. I hope that uh, with, uh, Apple comes and just came out with a new computer chip. <laughs> but, uh, and NVIDIA also, so that maybe uh, with the next generation of computers, it's possible to, to finally calculate the whole program. But um, so this is this is at the end where where it ends a, a little bit in a, in smoke and the worst case scenario. Um, this is this is for example this is uh, this model uh, uh, where you see how um, uh, so the dollars based on pure on the data of uh, IPCC and in fact they're using now our program because they only had the Unix where they could they had to type in every year. And then they, then it would render. So with us, they just could with the cursor and switch from 2000 to 2100 and see where it moves, where it, where it evolves. They never had that before. So now they use our program. And these are so um, it's generating. Uh, I had several characters of people, um, and uh, so for for conflict, for migration, for um, tourists, um, um, and uh, so it's a certain amount of each. And then to see how they would interact with one another. And then, so we had tests to bring these people together. And for me, it was so funny to, to bring these people together. That, so just in a test case. Uh, um, and um, so when you have somewhere protesters and police come and to, to knock them down and so. Uh, and um, so I made several test cases of that. Um, this was the other one that was cancelled, so this is just uh, where, uh, here I follow some uh, Syrian refugees, they squatted in Athens, uh, uh, and, um, uh, but they didn't get any food anymore after um, the, it was so-called solved by Europe, um, and then uh, there's a whole team that started to rent uh, some uh, farm places to, to cultivate by themselves their own food. So I followed them, and I followed also the Zad in, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, Nantes. 
And I, I was there at the moment that, that uh, the, the, the police knocked down. I was the only press journalist who was allowed. So I, I um, well, it's, I knew it was going to get too long. So but I, I could all, otherwise uh, show a little part where I have Chant contre Chant of me filming from the side of the police and then from the side of the, of the others or so. But from both, well, it, the other thoughts, of course, some of them, I knew some of them luckily, but, but the others started to think that I was from the police, so they started to throw stones and the bottles at me or something like that. But so I hope to finish uh, that, that one soon too. That's it. Thank you very much for everybody. I feel very humble and uh, a little bit grateful to uh, to present something after such insightful and inspiring presentation. I hope everybody is not sleepy, too sleepy. Uh, I will try to make it a bit. Uh, so I'm Florian Zanata. I'm coming from Liège, uh, Belgium, and I um, I would present in two uh, in two. Uh, times the first one will be focusing on the on the citizen ecological uh, science uh, lab that i co-founded two year a bit more than two years ago the experience that we had through that and um, and afterwards i will be a bit uh, talking about my work uh, as a researcher uh, there is a lot of bridges that could be made with a, a representation but i will let that for later so uh, so first so lasim is the name of the the um, this nonprofit that we co-founded and uh, that is a lab of a collaborative citizen multidisciplinary lab of uh, ecology mainly focusing on urban ecology first but uh, we spread also in a more forested and reserves also uh, in belgium and so the experience that I will try to show a bit is the, trying to make uh, this kind of uh, moments and in space and time so to bridge uh, between a citizen and, uh, and scientist and artist also uh, during this kind of event. So this is a map of uh, a satellite, satellite map of uh, Liège. Is this? Ah, oh, yeah, there is one. So with the Meuse River here and the Ourt River that goes from the Arden up there to go into the Meuse until it goes further north through Maastricht. And so the first exper experience, so this whole idea of doing, uh, to try to found or to uh, uh, experiment this uh, citizen uh, open lab, uh, kind of nomadic, and we don't have uh, an actual lab, we go uh, from places to places with a with portable stuff, portable microscopes, and so on, you will see. Uh, but the idea, we were coming from different fields. So I'm, I'm coming from a biogeography and botany fields, so doing ecological niche models, the climate change uh, uh, impacts on, on plants in Europe mainly. Um, that was actually one of the main uh, motivation also the, the realization that I was working during my old PhD thesis on a subject that was highly linked or inter interesting or important to um, to transfer as a knowledge to uh, the whole society and that was not of course uh, made as fast as it should be so it was a reflection of how to bridge easier between the ivory tower of science and the, the actual uh, life of citizen and we were thinking of how what which kind of event could be uh, interesting to organize and something that is uh, kind of uh, famous i i think you already heard about this kind of uh, event is bio blitzes so mainly bio blitzes are um, uh, biodiversity mo monitoring of one particular space in one particular area of time one day they mainly um in order to uh, increase the the knowledge of the biodiversity that is in particular places and the the interesting thing with that is that you could make it a uh, kind of open participative citizen even and that's what we basically organized so and the idea to kind of put it as a research project was to make it as a mapping collaborative mapping project using these bio blitzes as a way to increase the quality of uh, the data that uh, that, uh, exist. So that's my focus is a uh, botany. So I, I, I used first uh, the plant biology uh, um, focus. So this is the all working in Mesa Botanical Garden, and that that's the um, for the whole area. So that's more or less the 
the city of Liège. The whole area is the city of Liège. And all F dots here is a presence of uh, different plant species. And uh, that's the actual uh, data that was uh, uh, already uh, available on the observation.be platform, which is an open, um, an open source uh, platform where everything from the official uh, monitoring to any um, citizen uh, monitoring based on different applications that you can use, uh, everything is downloaded to uh, after uh, verification from experts from different fields, animals, plants, mushroom, uh, fungi, etc. Um, everything appears in the observation.be uh, platform. You can every and so you can select. Oh, you can select. Sorry, <laughs> you can select uh, an area and have all the data that is uh, that is uh, present there. So from this point of view, we realized that there were some in. in interesting spots and that was not the only reason to uh, to focus on this first spot this first spot here is the chartreuse uh, park which is an abandoned more or less it's a, it's a city park but it's very particular because it's actually uh, an old um, fortress and it was actually even before uh, um, an abbey from the Chartreuse monks, actually. So that was used afterward for during the First and the Second World War to uh, host uh, the secret services and, and the resistance also. Uh, so there is a whole story of war so behind that. That was also a part of the defense department until the 90s. And then it was back to, uh, to the Liège city that bought it back. And then they let it basically a bit go uh, away. Uh, so the, na the nature really recolonize the all um, also building area of the, the place so it's also famous for urbex and all this uh, uh, all this tendency but so that, that a bit look like that so you have the whole wood that is uh, something about 40 hectares in and so that's where we decided to organize the first bio blitz because also they were a very interesting uh, dynamic because of citizen uh, organizing there uh, starting in 2013, 2014, uh, because then they learned about a project that was actually here that was aimed to build new buildings uh, that on an area of three hectares, more or less. And they were very worried about that because they used, of, of course, a lot the whole wood to run, to walk their dog, or to just have a, a, um, a walk in the, in the countryside. As you see, it's really close from the center. It's just up a, a hill. And it's really unique to have this kind of big uh, forested areas uh, for an urban city uh, in uh, Western Europe in general. Um, so that's it. We just planned how we would manage to do a bio blitz. We didn't have any uh, previous uh, uh, experience except meeting and seeing people that were that already had organized some uh, some stuff like that. And so basically, we decided that there were uh, four different um, habitat types that were interesting to go to with the citizen and try to uh, sample and to monitor the most uh, diverse possibility of of, of life. Uh, and so there were hawthorn forest here that was kind of conserved and here ruderal species which means species that are adapted to perturbated uh, areas a forest border which is interesting also and also wetlands with a pond that uh, that is also part of a re of a reserve so basically there is very small areas where there is reserve and uh, conservation uh, uh, management but the rest is uh, is like abandoned and uh, recolonization uh, by wild nature. So yeah, that's how it it, it worked. Uh, so for this first biobits, we experiment uh, we experimented it because it was very big and we wanted to go on these different um, areas. We decided that it will be less guided. So we had people focusing on plants, people focusing on animals, people focusing on crypto games, which I was taking part of. So mosses, lichens, uh, molds, all this kind of uh, strange stuff. And uh, <laughs> and so we had the first uh, the first. Uh, uh, step was to go by group following these different experts in the different areas and then we had the second time uh, there where we could um, compare and trying to um, 
to identify more further uh, the species that we had. So we had also all this microscope that was uh, also very used by the people and they were children, uh, kids as uh, adults also very am amazed to look at a spider or anything like in, uh, under the microscope, which was uh, also nice. So nothing very special in, in at first sight because it's a recognized uh, pioneer forest that we call pioneer forest, forest is the first step of our uh, indigenous uh, forest uh, uh, cycles. So mainly, um, uh, but you saw it's the, not the willow, I don't remember the, the actual English name, but the, the willow also, uh, the ash, uh, all, all these uh, species that you can find in the wasteland base, basically. And so, yeah, it was guided. So that's one of my friend, uh, colleague, uh, that was showing the, these ruderal plants. And actually, there was also already very interesting stories to tell about these species. Some are non-indigenous. They came from uh, uh, elsewhere and they adapted because they are tolerant to this kind of uh, perturbated uh, um, area. But also, some uh, I had a friend, uh, a colleague from the Maze Botanic Garden that is specialized in lichens that uh, came to uh, to, to share with uh, the people uh, his knowledge. And that was a kind of uh, a highlight to be able to, on these two, three hours of uh, walk with the people and sharing, etc., to identify uh, around 37 species of lichens, including strange stuff like uh, lichens, lichenized fungi. So mainly a fungi that colonize a lichen that is already a fungi with the same biosis with an algae growing on a plant, which was like a, a kind of, uh, uh, say that kind of uh, yeah box in the box uh, habitat on the habitat on the species, which was kind of a nice reflection and to share with the people also. And yeah, and also we had the, the collaboration with an artist, um, a friend of us that uh, that is really interesting in the, in in nature and that is also a very nice uh, dynamic to uh, reuse. Um, uh, disposed material that he find everywhere and to uh, make what he called uh, public art so mainly like doing an art a life uh, painting somewhere and then letting it there for the people to to enjoy or that would represent something in relation to the to the place and so on so here he basically was uh, uh, adding some kind of uh, strange stuff going out of uh, a beetle because uh, a ladybug sorry because um, because we were with the, the with a friend that was uh, looking at the fungi growing the, the one of the colleague of maize botanic garden is specialized in the fungi that grows on bugs and actually there is a lot of uh, of them even in belgium not the amazing one that you see the zombie uh, style that you can have in uh, tropical areas but we have anyway uh, some uh, some um, fungi that grows on uh, on insects and it's a very very narrow uh, uh, topic of uh, research but it actually is a thing and very poorly known so another uh, the second biobits that we organized was um, also something interesting more on the historical point of view also and the dynamic, the relation to uh, post-industrial recolonization of the wild uh, species. Here is, is a terrier, so basically a spoil pit from the, um, the industrial uh, uh, time. So you had the, there you have uh, two terrier actually, you have uh, the battery ancien, so the old one, on which we, we organized the BioBlitz and the, the new one that is really more like a, a still a pit, a peak like that, that is way more unstable. So it was not so, uh, uh, it was not a good idea to go with the, the citizen there and the, the chance to lose one uh, on the boulders or something. So we focused there. And as you see here, it was really poorly sampled already. So that is uh, the whole plant species available for uh, on observation that be so since the 70s so there is very few uh, few data here available so it was also motivating to uh, to try to have a look so that is that's it here the old huge terrell that has been uh, erased um, like they they make it plain like that so uh, and and here the the newest one and so there the interesting thing was that 
so that looks like that the whole plane where so it's the whole table should be like that and then they they basically remove the part of, a part of it and um, and the interesting thing here we experimented uh, another way of doing the bio blitz more independently with the people uh, freely going and sampling looking at what they were interested in using the application so the application that we use that is connected to observation.be that you can all use if you want it's observation it's ops identify ops identify sorry but you can also use iNaturalist it works the same it was it's downloaded also on observation.be and on gbif which is the global biodiversity platform and so yeah there we we basically i i didn't show it here but we put flags colorful flags in different areas or once again ecotones or the separation the, the the zone that is in between the forest and the 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 moor or on the moor in the forest around the the little ponds etc to be able to be able to have the people going freely and sampling but at the same time being sure that every different habitat would be sampled at minimum so that was it. So it was kind of checkpoints uh, for the people to go. And once again, the collaboration with the, the friend who was uh, really in, in a mold blob phase. So he was really interesting in putting mosses and, and blobs uh, in, the, in the tree trunks. And the interesting thing in terms of evolution and ecology, urban ecology, was also that uh, it's because it's also an ancient industrial, highly uh, uh, polluted area. So basically heavy metals, as uh, Ronnie showed you in the first place, so cadmium, copper, uh, zinc, and uh, all these uh, heavy metals are in high concentration on these kind of uh, areas. And so you have species uh, invasive species. That is also a question, a philosophical question of uh, what is an invasive or spreading species. Uh, it all depends on the time scale. But uh, for example, here the Budlea that you know very well. It's not so visible here, but it's the flower, the um, butterfly um, uh, flower that you can find in every city in the world. Well, at least here. Um, and so that is a species that is very tolerant to heavy metal and that they grow basically in between rocks, uh, in between walls, etc. Uh, the Robinia, so it's also very spread and that's a different story. The Bedlia came because of the railway, um, uh, the, yeah, the railway uh, system that was, uh, uh, they, they, they bought and they planted this, uh, this species to uh, embellish, uh, so to say, the railway instead of using uh, local plants. So now it spread very well. And the Robinia is also something that was planted uh, the previous uh, century uh, for its uh, also beauty, etc. And this, uh, and on the side, you had also. Chelidon, uh, Chelidonium, that is uh, a, a local indigenous species that is very tolerant to heavy metal and that has also medi um, medicinal uh, properties, uh, very famous and tanktorial also. So that was uh, the, a point of reflection that we ended up with on the invasive species, and and in the end, it it brought brought us brought me. A, to uh, dig a, bit, a little bit on um, this invasive species, um, plant species um, topic. And that is something that was funny to, uh, to map. So it's once again, the whole uh, points are plant species, but uh, in gray, uh, you have spreading species. In black, you have highly invasive species. And the little pink there is soon to be invasive or to be its watch list they call that watch list because they did they don't know yet if it will be spreading it's too soon uh, to to know and what was in, interesting is that uh, so that's where how you look at it and i don't know if you see something appearing uh, there is some sorry yeah industrial areas indeed but sorry yeah, yeah, and actually here is the, the highway and the railway. So basically the species are very concentrated on the railway, along the railway, along the highways also, like that here. No, here, yeah. No, here there's the highway and the railway here. And, uh, and also, yeah, post-industrial areas, polluted areas, of course. So here is the, the railway that is really a stream of invasive species, a, a, a way of... Um, dispersal and that's connected to my research uh, side is that i'm interested in plant 
migration, plant uh, dispersion. And the second point uh, with this mapping, this first uh, like uh, yeah, this first step of uh, mapping uh, the biodiversity in the city is it was focusing on these areas that were uh, uh, amazingly poorly uh, sampled, and for two different reasons that are kind of uh, funny. This one is the most urbanized areas, the most gray. Uh, side of the, the city, so people are not really uh, maybe prone to also participate in the sampling or going to a monitor biodiversity and the public services neither because there is not really interest in, uh, in sampling with this on a, on a small uh, wasteland or something. And the other one here, which is more interesting, is the university campus. So it's basically a whole forest, protected forest, domenial forest, it's the Sartilement forest. And that was a bit surprising to see that they were so pu so poorly sampled. And the reason is another reason is uh, because there is actually a lot of data that has been uh, collected uh, during master thesis, PhD thesis, or researches, but that are kind of enclosed in the uh, um, hidden uh, from the open uh, platforms because they are basically in master thesis that nobody reads or PhD thesis PhD thesis that nobody reads neither. So overlooked or data not, not uploaded needs to do some more bioblitzes or to try to dig into the data sources uh, that could be uh, available. So yeah, another funny thing that we did, a bit crazy, we spent the whole night uh, wake, waking up uh, to do a, a moth uh, sample, which was kind of amazing. It was in actually in the wasteland of the, the Chartreuse Park that I showed you earlier. And we spent the whole night there with people completely drunk coming uh, and seeing us like, hey, what are you doing? And they were like, uh, we, we would just wait for the, because you, you have to wait the whole night. And then at 5, 6 uh, a.m. You, you collect and sample. And we were actually with the, um, the Flemish uh, um, uh, butterfly, uh, yeah, uh, entomology uh, society people that are really uh, libraries in it, in themselves. I, we didn't know nothing about the moth in, at first. And so once again, that was also a collaboration with this um, uh, citizen uh, association of La Chartreuse. So it's called Un Air de Chartreuse. Uh, and we, we, we after the, the whole night, we identified, well, they identified more than 80 different species of moss, which was kind of, uh, for us, really amazing for them. Oh, yeah, but there are classical species. It's just that nobody really do that uh, regularly. It's done, in once again, in reserve area and so on. So it was not amazing. There were like two or three rare species. But what was amazing is to find that much species in this time of the year in uh, a fully urbanized uh, area. It's just this this uh, little piece of wood conserved that was uh, yeah that was so yeah that's it i will i will pass through that that's one of the last one uh, that we organized also in um, uh, an area that was impacted by uh, pollution industrial pollution via montagne which is the first uh, factory the first industry that was uh, um, created in uh, Liège, one of the first actually in Belgium also. And so it's an historic uh, pollution that is in the soil and there is a, re uh, a conservation plan right now to reopen the place because some species, rare species adapted, tolerant to uh, uh, heavy metals uh, needs to be uh, in open environments and no because of nice, uh, this area. So that was also a collaboration with Chaufontaine, the commune there. Uh, anyway, it's out of time. But uh, it's uh, uh, also a video from uh, an activity that we did with uh, some kids from the communal primary school just next to that. So that was also a nice uh, experience. And then it's drawings from uh, an architect, uh, uh, landscape architect, uh, Elisa Baldin, which is one of the colleagues uh, I'm working with uh, in La Cine. And uh, so she's bringing the really historical side and uh, landscape and sensi sensible side on this bio -bit. So here is her drawing of the evolution of uh, time uh, with this uh, and the impact on this, uh, this particular thing. That's it. That's with uh, also kids where we uh, also popularize us the use of uh, binocular or microscope to try to draw something, and that is a collaborative map actually drawing. So 
what they call the sensible map. So I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, kind of, uh, of uh, topic. It's basically building a map that, that is not only a scientific, geographical, topographical, uh, accurate map is that, but with incorporation of sensible, personal um, aspects or stuff that, uh, that are highlights for you. So that was an experience to uh, try to do that with, uh, with children, with a uh, kid. And they were, they were very, and it's still ongoing. We are finishing the map right now. But uh, it's funny to see what was what is attracting the the own um, uh, yeah their own view and then that's the whole also philosophy of blessing is try to broaden the sight or the, the idea of what is the environment and what is the diversity of life in in your direct surrounding. They are all it's the it's the youth uh, association uh, uh, youth center. So that's it. I think I'm, I'm done. If I do. To show no. anything. <laughs> no, no problem. I will talk about Marxism another time, or if you wait for it. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Listening to all these fantastic presentations, I, uh, I have prepared a whole text to sort of connect everything, but I guess I will try to abbreviate that enormously. Uh, but this notion of one of the things that have always well, has inspired me a lot in, in dealing with this topic is, is this, uh, this book that uh, was, um, hey, <laughs> uh, was published in 2017 and you have to actually really turn it around so it is a very active book and it's called Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. Uh, so it has a ghost part and a monster part and it has fantastic authors like Ursula Le Guin and Donna Haraway, uh, who talks a lot about this issue of um, staying with the trouble uh, to create hybrid figures uh, and making with in symbiosis with critters or creatures, uh, of which we saw quite a, a few examples actually. And learning to stay with the trouble of living and dying together on damaged earth will prove more conducive to the kind of thinking that we provide the means to building more livable futures. And she's amongst others influenced by someone like, like Lynn Margulis, who uh, was the first to talk about the importance of symbiosis, the living with strangers, uh, actually living with others, out of which came also the idea that actually we as humans are a multitude uh, of, uh, that, that we have this, you, you talked about this, this uh, Religion that is living on a religion is living on a religion, but actually we, we are all that eh? uh, uh, if you look at us on a microscopic level. So the so-called well, well, I'm, I'm trying to skip some things without otherwise we sit here around midnight. But um, one of the things uh, that seem to be very important in all of your uh, research, because I think the artists are researchers. Scientists can be the artists in, in a way in, in, in the way that they do with it. Is is show is making visible the invisible. And and before we started this evening, Ronnie said, yeah, it, it depends a bit on how you define the invisible. And uh, so it, it's either what you cannot see, uh, for which you need a microscope, or it's things that we deny, uh, like like the uh, results of colonial colonialism. And I would like to connect that also, and so you can respond to all to it in, in whatever way, to the title of, of this evening, Restoring the Human Element. But in all of your talks, the human is actually quite, quite present. Poisoning the world, uh, doing research in a certain kind of way. Uh, so has the human ever been absent? Sort of like Latour's, we've never been modern. Uh, like, like human has always been there, but it depends a bit on, on how. So I don't know who wants to respond to that. Well, for me, actually, this, the, the, the title was, uh, was, uh, was it sounded also even even a little bit provocative. Yeah. Uh, uh, to restore the human like uh, like this one. Uh, <laughs> put him at his place and restore the rest. You know. Uh, um, so so that's. I, so I don't know where you want to go to with that, um, but uh, so yeah. But. 
Well, that's basically what I want to say about it. Okay. But for me, it was more human should be empathic, and it's not empathic anymore, the human being to the nature. And so I focused on the restoring this empathic part. Yeah, but perhaps uh, we, we have to realize that in terms of uh, the presence of humans at the time scales, mm -hmm. that we're uh, talking about that, uh, I would say that, um, let's say up to, yeah, maybe not more than 50 years ago, uh, humans have been completely uh, neglected of uh, and, and uh, realizing uh, uh, what their role and how they should uh, uh, be approaching the environment uh, that actually uh, uh, creates their own ecosystem. That realization only started, I think, much, much earlier than, let's say, the 1960s. So that is something like 50, 60 years ago. Uh, and it's only now that we're starting to realize that uh, uh, we have to become a, uh, a, 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 a careful and, and, uh, and, uh, with a certain awareness of how uh, we fit in, in the ecosystem that so far we have only been exploiting. But that's only 60 years ago that, that uh, uh, appreciation uh, developed. And uh, as I showed you on the graph with the oxygen profiles, uh, it's only 2007 that we got into the situation here in by scale that was, let's say, something that you could consider to be acceptable. So we have to, to, to realize that we basically are just starting to make sense in terms of uh, living and being part uh, of uh, uh, let's say the global uh, ecosystem. So we still have to learn a lot. In my opinion, we are only starting to do so. Yeah? So maybe if you look back in two or three hundred years, we will say, people, what have we been doing or before? How is this possible? Uh, and that is just emerging, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, even though, as uh, yes, Jean Eva stated that, that someone like von Humboldt uh, was very early in, in, in pointing out that things were terribly uh, were going terribly wrong. Uh, it is effectively only recently. And one of the responses to that has also been that like, yeah, the Earth could do without us humans. But someone like uh, as the astrophysicist yes, so Hubert Reeves has actually said, well, no, uh, we were, humans were not just simply added to nature, they, they form effectively a, a part of it, only they also have the responsibility, as you, you were pointing out. I don't know, do you both want to respond maybe to what has been said so far? Well, uh, I will agree with, uh, with every one that has uh, talked right now, but uh, yeah, it's, as I showed also, it's really at the core uh, of the Dynamic of this of last same level, so to try to broaden the the view and uh, on on the actual urban environment that has been viewed as something that is that is uh, where, where the diversity of life has disappeared, and that's true that has been very impacted. But uh, to show that uh, actually all uh, uh, life form lives behind uh, the, the walls, etc., uh, along the, the, the pavement of the streets and the, the that's a way to change the, the to zoom out or in uh, in the environment uh, that we all in, and to try to also uh, yeah restore. I will not say the restore the human, but to restore the the sites on what is uh, the diversity of uh, of life and the, the ecosystems around us to be able to uh, to have a better uh, yeah to have a better. I I believe that. If you don't have a connection to uh, something, if, if you don't experience firsthand something, you cannot care about something. So basically, that's the main idea that we that, that promoted the, the fact that we organize this kind of event, and also just biodiversity walk. That's also something that uh, that uh, rings a uh, bell when they were the, during the, the presentations. The, the philosophical aspects of, uh, of, of of all this. Uh, it's interesting. I was I'm still collaborating with a philosopher that is a colleague from uh, 
Sebastian Depré and uh, so connected to uh, to um, Anna Singh uh, for to the book uh, that accompanied me and uh, I met Anna Singh actually uh, that when uh, she she went on the Chartreuse Park for the ZAD uh, so just to wrap up that uh, it was. Oh no! Yeah, for the experiment of the autonomous uh, yeah. activist uh, zone that was uh, defending there to fight against the, the building uh, project, but um, and she was there by chance. She was receiving the honoris causa of the okay. university. But um, but the fellow doctor that was uh, organizing this, uh, it was really interesting in this biodiversity, biodiversity walks that we were organizing in the city, and so he wanted that I go with him. And he recorded uh, the discussion that we had. And the funny thing is that he just, I was just wanting to cross a bridge of the city to look at the little lichens and mosses that was growing on the concrete, basically, or even on the, uh, yeah, the pavement and the, on this bridge that was fully artificial. And, uh, and we ended up by spending the whole hour just doing 100 meters because there were so many discussion ideas and he was going with this philosophical point of view of uh, uh, space and time changing with this, the, the scale. So the more you go on smaller scale, the more you extend your the, the space, basically. So you, you, you make a step or you stay. Yeah. Before I give the, the mic to, to Mario Lang, maybe to respond is that in uh, Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, um, they stress the importance of curiosity. They say, in order to survive, we need to relearn multiple forms of curiosity. Curiosity is an attunement to multi-species entanglement, complexity and the shimmer all around us. And that, that when you talk about your work with, on electricity, that we don't see it anymore, I think that is quite related, isn't it? And to this notion of, of uh, curiosity and, and the need for curiosity. Um, yes, also, the yes, the invisible also, I think a notion that is important is empathy and feeling connected and related to, to your surrounding and uh, to things that are out of sight, maybe somewhere else on this planet and the effect of your actions, they have an effect somewhere else. Um, and I think when, when I was thinking about restoring the human element, I also thought about that, like the, it's not only about the ecosystem, but it's also affecting a lot of people's lives everywhere around the world. And uh, that's something that's also sometimes overlooked uh, and, and, and not, uh, not so much seen in connection to, to, um, uh, to each other. Like, a lot of things are separated these days, and I think it's very important to see things as a, more as a whole and, and how things are interconnected and, and related to each other. So, Yes, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. But <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the idea of, of, of the notion of entanglement or the, the the tree of life that is replaced by a web these days as well. You wanted to respond, Juan? Yeah, I wanted to say something also about which is a little bit also the, the, the opposite side in the sense that um, uh, there are now talks like we have to do, we have to start geoengineering. Um, because it's too late, so we have to start managing the, the, the planet. And so um, there's one solution, which is a solution of like get everyone their own energy and get uh, uh, um, um, that we don't pollute anymore. But um, uh, the politics should change in that sense. But you see now, uh, um, I just read that uh, Belgian policy, policies, uh, uh, they decided to have this mini um, uh, nuclear uh, power plants. Um, instead of, there are so many other alternatives, but that's not the manager's mentality. So they need to centralize the energy so that we can distribute and that there's an internal passing by the CASA uh, uh, all the time by the by central control. Um, but that's what I see what is happening. So it's too late now, now we have to take control. And, and that's, um, I think that's, that's a scary thing, which is not put the, uh, man on the side. No, now we have to go and really get on top of it. It's a hyper modernist method. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, humans are regulators as well. Yeah. 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 
Oh. Yeah, the, the, maybe the, the connection is uh, you have what I presented is uh, regulators from a biological perspective. Now the next step, uh, and it starts with that there is a kind of uh, a biological evolution that I am using called cultural evolution uh, 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 because uh, if you look at the human evolution, biological evolution translates continues into cultural evolution. And the, 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 the thing is, uh, uh, it's also in biology, uh, the driver is to become more and more independent of your environment. Okay? And uh, the last, one of the most final biological steps was to become independent from temperature. Okay? So only birds and mammals have been able to do that. But then also part of biological evolution is the evolution of the brain. And uh, especially then the human brain has created the possibilities to uh, escape from the limits of biological evolution. It's of course still intended by the brain, so that's a biological company. But then the next step is to uh, uh, discommit you from your biological uh, limitations. And then we start to invent all kinds of things. Housing suite heat is a simple example, but also mobile phones is do things that the biology can no longer do. And that's the cultural evolution. Now, man has taken that so far, uh, and sometimes uh, in a rather, let's say, uh, accelerated and not so smart way, uh, that uh, all kinds of accidents have happened. And that's something that we are ending up now, that we now have to uh, start to really hear uh, uh, again, by our the capacities of our biological brain, but then in cultural uh, evolutionary context, to uh, uh, start to now to try to uh, yeah readjust what actually has gone totally wrong and has gone totally wrong. Let's say over a period of uh, not much more than 100 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and there are now limitations. It's no longer about let's stop this and that, it will, uh, it will return back to the normal thermodynamics. That will not happen anymore. Right? We have basically passed that point. And so, uh, yeah, we are getting into, uh, we can call it uh, regulation, but it's basically remediation uh, as far as possible. Yeah. Um, as, as a final question, maybe, uh, and, and maybe also quite crucial question in. in uh, uh, that was raised in the introduction. Uh, so can the arts effectively play a role in rectifying the imbalance by reintroducing the human and environmental element as the center of scientific and technological advancement? And Donna Haraway in this context stresses the fact that the arts of living on a damaged planet demand a symbiotic thinking and action. So that is to say, a making with. Now, when observing all of your, your presentations uh, and seeing how you, Roni, or you, Florian, uh, uh, work with artists uh, or, or are interested in how they, they work, it seems that, that artists are extremely good in, in visualizing uh, uh, the invisible. I, I was very happy in, in that, well, happy with all the presentations, but some of the elements that I didn't know about your work uh, where you actually go into the labs and make things visible that, that stay invisible and, and, and are critical, and then, then you visualize it as well. And they use my visual. Well, yeah, well, yeah. And, 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 and also, like, like oh, yeah, the, the program that, that then can be used. You talked about they use our program, so you work it with a team, I, I imagine. Well, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe the, um, the, uh, this was uh, so I worked with uh, with an, uh, with people from a game uh, a company in the states in California. They don't they don't want to be mentioned, so they did that in their spare time. But so uh, on a low cost because some of them they wanted to participate in these kind of things. But don't use our names. <laughs> but then. Um, one of the things for us was uh, so. In fact, it, uh, um, it's a very interesting research to see, like, how can we visualize this? Uh, so we have all this data, and then um, so we turned it into this. Well, uh, IPCC also works with those maps, 
but but they were very um, they were not so dynamic as the way that we started to use them. And then also to have these maps with all the data to, to transfer the literal in, uh, in in visuals, like uh, uh, um, so much population, so that then you see so many people walking around there uh, or um, um, uh, buildings that grow like mushrooms at that place. Uh, um, so that's uh, um, yeah. But then, so how how to make those maps? That was a program that was for us very easy to scroll through and so. But then I didn't know. But, but then uh, the, the scientists we were working with, they said, but "It's such a fantastic program that we make. We're using it now." <laughs> yeah, I think artists have a different approach, a different view, and for me, it's clear that I want to transmit something and uh, give uh, more connection back to the humans. And I think visuals are more staying in the brain than uh, having a data or historics, anything, you know. For example, for the paper trees, if you know that your trees in the garden will be cut and not grown back because you're using piles of paper, you have a different relationship to it instead of looking how many kilograms I, I'm using. And I think that's uh, advantage of being an artist that your brain is maybe working a bit different or you don't have this uh, limit or you have to have, to, uh, have to have a result, you know, to have to show in your lab. It's only you, you want to tell something, and telling in a different way. So I think that's uh, good to have this mixture between art and song. I think yeah, I absolutely agree. I think in terms of uh, the visualization, that's one thing. And, and that is, I think, more to, to, to present the message, uh, to make it visual and, and also generate the, the absolutely needed uh, impact, uh, the reach out. But there is also something else, and I think we already referred to it, uh, and that is where. Uh, in the beginning of the project, we got an idea that we bring the brains of the art, art artists and the scientists and perhaps all, all the stakeholders together. Because I also believe that in the way uh, we approach things, we think about things, uh, there may be different parts of the brain that are activated. And what we are missing today is to bring these together at the moment of the creation. Often it happens at the moment when the product is already there. Uh, it's also of interest uh, the, the thing that you mentioned with these uh, software developers in, in, in gaming. Uh, 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 and in, in, it's, it's in your application, but it's also it, it's going more and more that they, they develop their software with challenges uh, to, to make a game, uh, uh, and that must operate hard and do all kinds of things. Challenges that are not exactly the same that what on average, in science, a pop up. And that's why the game uh, software developers are, in certain aspects of uh, programming, much more advanced uh, than uh, the, the informatics uh, scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there are uh, a number of examples already now that uh, basically a tool developed from a scientific perspective, as the example that we give. Uh, 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 can be, uh, let's say, uh, much more advanced just by using uh, the knowledge and the things that these gamers have developed in a completely different niche. We were not thinking about that at all. Mm -hmm. yeah? But now we see that that can be brought together. Mm -hmm. But I think the same can happen when, uh, in an early phase of the project, you also bring the brain of the artist into the science or vice versa, mm -hmm. because that can also happen. Well, yeah, I, if you always ask me if I want to respond, I will say yeah. yes. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I couldn't agree more with what has just been said. I would just maybe add that uh, well, there, there's two funny things. Uh, just uh, parenthesis for the, the, I was amazed by the project of also the, the video game um, company collaboration. And it's actually a dream uh, that I had before creating this open lab. I first, when I just uh, defend defended my my phd thesis i was really showing basically maps and that was one of the my motivation to 
seek into the technological advancement of uh, the mobilization capacity, etc., trying to integrate the migration capacity by wind, something completely crazy and actually not feasible. It was just a, a way to uh, increase the, the, the realness or the, the, the reliability of the model, but it, it's, it was a bit, uh, yeah, it's just an ongoing process. But I was just thinking, like, this is visually showing the impact of possible climate changes uh, scenarios on maps. So that's basically something that I found it like something really nice to uh, to show or to uh, to spread or to uh, to yeah to to spread the curiosity also at the, 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 the create a, a more visually uh, explicit uh, material for for this kind of research uh, for uh, it's way more sexy than a uh, GIC like, uh, an IPCC uh, report uh, to to read for the people to show a map of what was what will be going on really if we uh, align with the models and I met a less enthusiastic uh, video game developer that told me it's very expensive to develop a video game so or, your idea is really nice to uh, because my idea was was really naive it was just I'm using model where I integrate different parameters of climate wind uh, current topography uh, etc and I was saying this could be converted as uh, parameters from a video game and you could play a video game that, that is based on different climatic scenarios and, and actually I have a, a very close friend that is working in the video game industry but uh, working as a visual artist, uh, uh, character designer and, uh, and he was pretty excited but you know it's not, it's, it's not realistic to uh, yet unfortunately to combine science with video game industry that's, that's a pain, that's a really uh, okay. huge chance that you had this collaboration and I think that's really promising. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe Maya Lang as well. Can you, can you talk about this, this notion of visualization as, 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 as important, the important input by the artist? Do you think? Um, yes, and I also think it's very important to see, for me, to collaborate with. I, I collaborate with a lot of different disciplines, also artisans or uh, technicians and scientists. I, I think it's for me it's in the end also very important to make an artwork that communicates something that cannot be communicated by science mm -hmm. and it emphasizes things that cannot be objectified or cannot be researched like science can be researched. I think art is really a different way of looking at the world in that sense and I think collaborations with all these different disciplines can really even make it more wide your perspective and, and be more innovative and um, yeah, cross borders in, with, with sometimes materiality or um, yeah, uh, ecosystems or any, any kind of subject we're working with. And besides that, I think it's also very important to, yeah, to always look in a different kind of context, like social political dimensions of certain issues, which is not mostly not the kind of uh, perspective of scientists per definition when they're working on a topic because they're very specialized in a certain area within a very specific place without maybe looking at uh, relations to other sciences or other uh, um, things that are going on in, in society at that moment of time, which I think art can also be um, uh, helpful in looking at this kind of, uh, making these kind of connections. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. I don't know, are there any questions in the audience? Does the audience have any questions? Or are we just very tired now? <laughs> Uh, then, in, in that case, I would like to thank you all very much. Uh, I thought it was a really interesting conversation to hear all your presentations. I hope the audience liked it as well, otherwise they wouldn't be here anymore, I guess. Uh, so, thank you all. Thanks for the organization, for the invite. And I... You want to say something, Christoph? Yes, thank you for staying so long in this uh, marathon. Um, thank you, Alexandra, for uh, co-organizing this, and Edith, of course, for uh, the moderation. Thank you, uh, all the artists and scientists, or artist scientists. Um, it was a very interesting evening, I think, and a lot to think about uh, in our art practices or our researchers. Uh, so uh, uh, let's have a drink on that. Thank you.